So very excited about our next segment. Um, two phenomenal guests. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <laughs> That's great. So <laughs> there you go. Live on air selfie. Yes, yeah. it's fantastic. I love it. Dr. Karen DeSalvo and Susie Granzik, um, Granzik from EY. Do you want me to help Justin? <laughs> I'm teasing. Yes. Grzancic. Grzancic. <laughs> Susie Grzancic. Principal, health advisory from EY. And Dr. Karen DeSalvo, former national coordinator of the ONC and acting assistant secretary of HHS. Correct. Excellent. Hey, Justin. How are you? Fantastic. And thank you very much for joining us back on air again. And thank you for doing a selfie on air again. Of course. <laughs> so Fantastic. happy to be here. No, you guys are wonderful, and thank you. Um, so the segment came up um, for women in health IT uh, and all the great work that you guys, you both are doing. So we want to take a little bit um, of a fresh start there. But, but before we dive in too deep into the, uh, the dialogue, I first of all want to take a moment to thank you, Karen for all your work that you've done. You've been a phenomenal collaborator, and you still are, but when you were national coordinator and working on Capitol Hill, um, we as an industry, uh, I come from the vendor side uh, as well, and um, you, your team, were just phenomenal collaborators, and I think we were able to get a lot done, uh, still a lot more to accomplish, but we just always appreciated working with you and working with your team, uh, and so I want to say thank you for your service in the government. Well, Justin, thank you. It was really my pleasure to get to serve you and the American people and we, we wanted to have a big tent and an open door because we serve you. You mm -hmm. are the boss, not you particularly, Justin, right. but everybody, <laughs> yes. all the taxpayers and, yes. and others who are getting, getting service uh, from us. And, and it was a real joy. And I'm so thrilled that so many of the team there to keep, are going to be able to keep carrying forward on that kind of approach. Yep. Nope. Thank you. So before we dive into the segment specifically, what have you been up to over the last um, couple of months? And well, it's been just four weeks. Yeah. But it's been a really nice respite. I think uh, as many people advised me, they said to run run through the tape. Uh, as a runner, I, mm -hmm. I, I really understood that. Do some negative splits. Make sure you get everything done that you can, that you want to get done. And then take a rest um, because it's important to really reflect upon not only uh, what you accomplished, um, where you think there's still opportunity to make a difference with your skills and your interests. And so that's exactly the process that I'm in. And I have to say it's hard to... Uh, to let go. You never do that because you're in love with all the work that you've been doing and, mm -hmm. and all the people engaged. But I've just been taking a bit of time to really think about where we all need to go next. And you were very, you did a lot of work in the public health sector mm -hmm. uh, before you came onto the ONC. Yes. And obviously some of your passions there, but are there other sectors or other passions that you might have or what do you, what do you think um, for the future? Life coach, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, um, I'm a doctor first, yeah. and I uh, spent 20 years of my life practicing medicine and teaching people to practice medicine and running healthcare settings from primary care and being engaged in hospital management. And, and at the time of Hurricane Katrina, my course shifted, and I, though I was engaged in research at the time and teaching and administration and clinical care, uh, the community came first, and I got more and more engaged in policy, which led me um, not only to be the health commissioner for the city of New Orleans, but eventually to yep. Washington. And sure. where I capped off my time in, in HHS was uh, as assistant secretary for health, uh, as you say, and focused quite a bit on um, on how we can really improve the health of all people, leveraging tools like healthcare, but recognizing that there's more to health than healthcare. That the fact that your geography, your zip code matters more than your genetic code sure. is uh, going to require all of us to really not only leverage data, but leverage the tools and resources we have to, to bring health. You know, this is um, a time in history when we have so much opportunity, but we're even still seeing declines in life expectancy and widening yes. gaps. And so I want to try to understand how not only me personally, but how we can bring all the great resources and thinking in this country to bear to make that not the case so that we can reverse that curve and, and close that gap. I love it. No, that's fantastic. So Susie Grzanzik, thank you for joining us. This is your first Absolutely. time on the show. Um, and you've been involved with discussions with HIMSS and uh, Women in Health IT. Uh, and I, I believe it's the um, Women Fast Forward Initiative from EY. So tell us about that and tell what you guys are working on. Sure. So Women Fast Forward is really trying to look at uh, the perception out in the industry that gender pay parity and gender equality is probably a lot further progressed than it really is. And so what Women Fast Forward tries to do is start a, a conversation um, at an international level around those issues based in fact, um, talking to business leaders around the world 
And what EY's tried to do is take a leadership role in that conversation and to really think about how do we accelerate gender pay parity. So I'd probably cite two different reports. One is actually through HIMSS, where they looked at some longitudinal data from 2006 to 2015 and said, you know, what is the difference in women healthcare IT, uh, essentially their pay versus men in comparable fields? And over that time, it's been about a, uh, they say about a 3% gap has, it's actually worsened. And then you look at something like the World Economic Forum, and they focused on looking at gender pay parity. And between 2014 and 2016, another 30 some years were added in terms of their longitudinal look to say, when would we reach gender pay period parity? Mm -hmm. So when we look at the numbers, um, our perception is not reality. Very good point. So you brought up the World Economic Forum. Do you work with them at all? The, um, this gentleman, Oliver Olivier, I met last week in Atlanta, who is over from Paris, who uh, works on the forum, and he, I guess he leads strategy, but we're, he's working on value-based care models globally. Um, so I don't know if I just kind of just came across him for the first time in my life. But. So we don't work for, for the no, economic with, yeah, forum right. so much as trying to make sure that we work with them yes, and incorporate yeah. information that they're putting out around reports and things like that into sure. that global conversation. Because the more often that you can make it fact-based and bring it to life yep. um, and really look at something that's an international uh, body of study, uh, we think that's where you'll see some of the biggest impact and acceptance around numbers. I completely agree. So what do you see? Are we making progress or where are we with um, the pay the pay gap in, with women in health IT? So again, I'd have to point to that HIMSS study around specifically women in healthcare IT, mm -hmm. and that was about, I think, 2.7% was it, it actually worsened about 3% mm -hmm. over their study period of time. Um, it showed that it was a little bit worse when you looked at some of the senior ranks of leadership. And I think that just speaks to the level of focus and perception and measurement that is probably not happening at the right level to make sure that real progress is being made. So I think it's an area that needs as much focus to improve those numbers as anything. So, and you won the award, is that? Um... There, were, there are a few of us actually yep. that are awardees, yes, yes. of the, the women, in, women of Influence in Health IT. Yes. It's really quite an honor. So tell us about that and, and tell us you know, the direction for that and, and what you guys hope to accomplish beyond the obvious of, of mm -hmm. more income. I guess um, I'm going to let Susie t say more about the mm -hmm. awards, um, but I, I want to just uh, thank Hims and, and thank Carla Smith and others for and the yeah. committee for launching it. It's important that we make sure we're recognizing role models and lifting up um, people who are going to be approachable, accessible, and be willing to help mentor the next generation, not just of women in health IT, but men as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a it's a it's an important and um, valuable opportunity to, to make certain that uh, women know that health IT is a big tent and that we are going to welcome in the best and the brightest and the most eager. It's one of the things I love about the health IT community is it is welcoming, it's open to innovation and new ideas, and it's important, I believe, uh, that HIMSS has really spotlighted the value that women are bringing to health IT and the need for us to make sure that we're uh, recognizing role models and, and allowing for that pipeline to really build. And when Karen speaks to that concept of recognizing role models, uh, one of the things that we focus a lot on is how do you illuminate the path to leadership? Yes. So I, I think one of the, the pain points for everyone is you have some women doing incredible things within the health IT space, and yet you look at kind of the generation coming up or people interested in those types of careers, and they don't necessarily see a path or see that you know arms wide open, the tent is open, to come around them and help them also think about the innovations that they can make in IT and the, the steps they can take in their career because we are wrestling with such big gnarly problems mm -hmm. within healthcare that we need every mind we focused do. on them and that gender equality is part of it. Uh, the diversity of thinking that you'll see between men and women, um, different cultures all coming together is what's going to start really making progress. I, I want to layer on top of that, Justin, that, um, you know, it's, it's obvious I was the first female national coordinator <laughs> And uh, that, that um, 
was simply uh, more than anything, I think, an opportunity for women in the field to to see the chair held by someone mm -hmm. who was like them. Um, I, I, I would say also that our, uh, during my time at, at ONC, at the Office of the National Coordinator, I, I was really deliberate about increasing diversity not only on my own team and not just based on, on gender, but on background, race and ethnicity, and we wanted to do that on our advisory committees as well. I think the, one of our responsibilities in the, in the federal space was to make sure that we were setting the tone that this has got to be yeah. a, a big tent and people are going to have opportunity. So what are some of the best practices there? Because, I mean, me, uh, I've been fortunate to have a couple companies and so forth, and, and um, how do you advise us, or how can we get better, um, and what do we look out for, and, and what can we do? What are some best practices there? So one of the things we tried to do with NEY was talk to global business leaders, and we talked to men and women, and I think it was about 400 around the world, as well as trying to draw from our own experiences. And we said, what are things that could essentially accelerate or create some quantum leaps around gender diversity Excellent. and advancing women in a profession. And I think one we just mentioned was really illuminating that path to leadership, um, providing sponsorship, which is really putting your personal weight and brand behind individuals versus mentoring, which is having conversations and coaching, uh, showing that role model uh, where it's possible. So Karen showed it's possible mm -hmm. and it's something that's very valuable to take on. And then also thinking about creating corporate policies that create a foundation to allow for women to be successful as they continue through the ranks and through their leadership roles. And then really one of the hardest ones is trying to uh, make sure that you're weeding out unconscious as well as conscious bias. And I can, I can give an interesting example sure, when please. we're ready, but it's just, um, it's probably the hardest one to, to fight. Mm -hmm. Unconscious bias by its very nature is you just, you're not thinking about it and it's just the way you're reacting to situations. We, we, when I was in academics, I was one of the, uh, usually the only female in the room, actually, and I was really early um, in, in my academic career, but it evolved over time, and it evolved because of deliberate thinking on the part of the entire team, male and female, that we needed to make sure we had a diversity of opinion and we were inclusive and in providing opportunities um, for, for a pathway to leadership. And, and academics and medicine have been uh, increasingly successful mm -hmm. in, in, that, in that sphere. But there's a subtle piece to this, which um, is worth just um, pointing out that uh, sometimes sometimes there's, there's a need to have, um, I'll call it cross-gender mentoring. So a mentor, as a, as, a, as a woman, to have a male mentor, mm -hmm. and, because they're gonna have networks that maybe senior people above you didn't true. have. That's and so point. this isn't just about women mentoring or being role models for women. This yeah. is about everyone recognizing talent and being, yes. well to, being willing to foster it and support it and, and, and think about it as, again, a big tent and an opportunity for the best ideas to come forward. So uh, a couple things that come to mind around that, very much that concept of needing men to act in those same sponsorship roles, not just having a one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. woman-to-woman mentorship mm -hmm. or sponsorship. Uh, for example, Steve Howe within our EY team is our America's managing partner, and he's the head of our inclusiveness um, organization as well as his larger role, because it's that visible leadership, both with men and women talking about this, that's gonna make some change. Um, I can share thinking through some team assignments myself, and it's about opportunities that get presented. So when I talked about unconscious bias, um, young female leader on our team, uh, there was an international opportunity coming up, and one of the unconscious biases might say, you have a young family, you probably don't want to travel, and so I, or someone else, might never put that opportunity in front of you, because I've essentially almost made that decision for you, thinking, I know right. best, or I know the difficulty of potentially raising a family and traveling. Putting the control and providing the opportunities back in the hands of, of that woman yes. and maybe giving good counsel and mentorship around it is really more important than filtering opportunities. It's broadening the opportunities. It's an excellent analogy. Because that person reason, yeah. Yeah, might actually have a support structure that said, go international, right. uh, you know, I'll back you up. Yep. Nope, that's uh, fantastic. Um, so tell me what's coming up in 2017, or maybe even around, you can talk about him 17 in, in the next couple of days. Is there something that we should look out for? Are there a couple of sessions that, uh, that would be educational? Because you just bring up a very good point that that's subconscious in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I love that example. So where can we learn as an industry, as individuals? Well, I know we have a round table. We're having a round table in the morning at 9 a.m. Okay. And I don't know the room number, but it, right. it's a, a women yep. in health IT round table. Yep. So I'll be there. Others will be there. It's a great opportunity, I think, for a more informal dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, there is an event this evening where the, with the, for the awardees. And um, then, of course, there's always the hit chicks, which are um, always out in force and tweeting. And they have a meetup tomorrow. Um, and, I, and I think it's at 10 or 11. And maybe somebody uh, will tweet about it and, and make sure that we know when that is. They're a fun group of really oh, energetic. Yeah. Jen Denard is part uh, of that. She oh, was on my yes. radio show a couple weeks ago. And, and they, yeah. always, they always make me smile and laugh. And then yeah. there's a women's reception, which uh, just this evening. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing is you say what to look forward to is mm -hmm. thinking about content within HIMSS in the, in the coming years that yep. actually focus on some of those things, um, illuminating that path to yes. leadership. I mean, the Women in Healthcare IT Awards are one way to see great examples this evening, mm -hmm. uh, people to look up to, to model, and to get to know. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot more we can do, and we can be very, very specific and um, pragmatic about making real change and measuring that. I completely agree. And Denise Hines is, gonna, is another just role model for, for all of this as well. She's a very dear friend, and she I'm sure she's involved. I know she's involved in this initiative as well. well we have a great team at ONC. Don't forget them. I'm, I'm not with them any longer. <laughs> you do. But, like, yes, you, you do. know, Elise Anthony and Lisa Lewis. Uh, there, you know, Rebecca Freeman. There's just mm -hmm. a lot of really um, other others that I would ask folks to seek out because sometimes they're they're mm -hmm. uh, in the government, and so you don't always think of that. But by the way, government parity pays uh, pretty nice because <laughs> they often publish your pay. So it's easy. Good point. Yeah. Um, what about coming up with EY or this year in 2017? Um, are, what initiatives are, should we look out for, or that we're going to hear about maybe in coming in 2017 around this? So I think you're going to continue to see that concept of women fast forward out in the market. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely uh, things that have been spoken about at Davos, panels that yes. were there, um, a lot of global forums uh, at International Women's Day coming up in about two or three weeks here. Uh, that will be kind of being bold and taking on that challenge around gender pay and diversity is coming up. And I think you're just going to continue to see corporate and social policy and just really a focus in the market and telling those stories about women IT leaders and, and just women, inspirational women's leadership stories and how to build those networks and those formal programs that can actually lead to women in leadership roles. Now, that's, so carrying that theme and, and kind of our closing here, what, um, what advice would you offer um, women in health IT and in our sector and what best practices might you point out to them? So I think the first thing I would say is to keep such a, a broad mind to what types of opportunities can come up. And I think about the women I've worked with both on our payer and provider sides who um, might have been a, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, mm -hmm. um, and suddenly start to see that they're loving data and analytics. And they start to then bridge across once opportunities and sponsorship are there to say, all right, you know what, I can be a, an informatics leader because I know the business, uh, I know how to put patients at the center of, of care, and now I can also start to bring and wrap around things like the data analytics and, and innovative ways um, to refocus the industry. So I, I think it's that, that concept of that broad mindset, mm -hmm. coaching people about their opportunities, and then really um, measuring whether there's true progress being made and, and keeping that going. Because the problem is you stop, and then you think you've made progress and you haven't. Well, I think uh, I, I think there's an intentionality around management and leadership that people must take into account, no, no matter who they are, mm -hmm. and, and really be thoughtful about whether you've got um, the kind of diversity of thought on your team, not just diversity of gender. Uh, I want to uh, not get out of here without making the point that as we're thinking about diversity, we mm -hmm. need to think uh, along many lines, including race and eth ethnicity. Yes. It's yes, an important area of work that we need to do in health IT. And I would just make a plug for the broader pipeline, the importance of reaching even more deeply into high schools, junior high, and really encouraging young women to feel comfortable, or continue to feel comfortable with math, which STEM with, and so, with yeah. STEM yes. careers, yeah, because sure. we want to make sure that we're letting them know that they have value, that they're valuable, and that they're completely capable of doing it. So There's true. such cool programs, whether it's Girls Who Code, um, mm -hmm. the different conferences and forums, but I think it's, 
um, knowing about those, creating the opportunity, and really having parents, teachers, educators, and people within the payer and provider practice going out into the schools and educating them to, this is what it's like to develop a product that could suddenly be a wearable for a patient. And how does it feel knowing that your grandmother or your mother or your father are actually using those things um, and you could create the next generation of that? Excellent point. No, Jen Denard on a radio show a couple weeks ago talked about Girls Who Code, you know, that initiative. So that's fantastic. And you brought up a neat point because I just did this and I'm, I'm going to see her in a few minutes. But um, I just hired a nurse um, to lead my clinical strategy for one of my companies. And she she's amazing in her own right. But having such a, that clinical background and then she's also she knows pop health, she knows analytics, she knows quality reporting. Um, and so she's going to be an amazing leader um, in that, and I'm certainly going to help and, and support You've already this. written her performance <laughs> review. She's going to be like, I'm going to phone in this year. <laughs> but you know, a lot of work to do. And, and <laughs> nursing has an advantage on, on the physician training community because they've been engaged in nursing informatics. So she, right. Right, it's, it just becomes a natural part of what they're learning as part of their curriculum, right. which is so exciting. And we need more of these people every day in healthcare, and yes, that need is do. only growing as Especially well. Especially as we're doing more care coordination, so right, and more, more reaches across, you know, across other disciplines as physicians we just aren't trained as well in that and nurses definitely are so I think there's and great one the, opportunity one of the True. points I love about that is repurposing your career that I mean I think that's just a key thing as well is that you don't necessarily yep. have to grow into a technology career as your high school on up uh, goal it often is a position you take as you start to advance your career and see possibilities very true ladies fantastic conversation thank you so much Susie Grazanik Dr. Karen DeSalvo Thank you for joining the show today. Thank you, Justin. You guys are Enjoy you. hymns. <laughs> Thank you. You as well. Take care.